Uh, hi, Zand. Oh, hello, Chris. Sir, what have you been doing? Making toast and jam. Would you like some? Oh, I'd love some. I love toast and jam. Uh, actually, no, I, I hate toast and jam. Well, more for me. Oh, whoa, whoa, Zand, before you eat that, when was the last time you washed your hands? Looking at them, I'd say fairly recently. Well, I think it's time to wash them again. Never mind that, Chris. It's time for Investigation Ouch. Every single day, your hands come into contact with all sorts of things, picking up a lot of bacteria along the way. But just how often do we wash our hands? Well, I'm going to find out using a special scientific tool called asking people. When was the last time you washed your hands? Uh, just before I left the house, which was probably about 20 minutes ago, maybe. Oh, really? OK. A couple of hours uh -huh. ago? Yeah. yeah. At school. When was the last time your dad washed his hands, do you think? I think it was never. You think he's never washed them? Uh, no. Morning. Oh, In the morning. Yeah. What time is it now? It's about... <laughs> it's late, late afternoon. So, maybe we don't wash our hands quite as often as we think we do. But why does it matter how clean our mitts are? Well, there are harmless bacteria on your hands, but your hands also play a crucial role in spreading illness. In fact, four out of every five illnesses are spread using your hands. Although you don't need to wash them all the time, washing your hands before you eat and after you go to the loo is very important, and I'm going to show you why. So, I'm gathering as many handprints as possible on a special jelly which will help to show what bacteria are on people's hands. That's well brilliant. Next, I want to take a second handprint after their hands have been washed in water to see if there's a change in the amount of bacteria. Finally, I want to see the difference soap makes. So I'm getting my volunteers to wash their hands with soap and water. OK, so you do the backs of your hands. Oh, you get your in between your fingers. This is an absolute masterclass in hand washing. <laughs> What about a nice, clean high-five? Now our samples head off to the lab, where they are put in an incubator set at exactly 37 degrees, which is the same temperature as your body. They will happily grow in this perfect bacteria-breeding environment for 48 hours. Keeping an eye on our batch is virologist Rhiannon Lowe. So, Rhiannon, what have we got here? OK, these are the plates that haven't been washed. So we've got normal skin flora that we've been growing up. So we've got lots of Staphylococcus species. We've got Streptococcus species. And that's kind of exactly what you would expect this from is, a regular hand. This is normal hand flora. You can see the four fingers and you can see the thumb. Check out these furry fellas. Like to smell? Ooh, yeah. that, is, Ooh. Uh, that is a strong smell. So these are bacteria that you might find on your hands after not washing your hands after going to the toilet, okay. so they will be faecal bacteria. Yep, that means poo, and these bacteria can cause food poisoning. So can we have a look at the next lot then? Yeah. A lot of people don't wash their thumb very well at all, so your thumb tends to have a lot more bacteria on them. Well, what, people just stick their Yeah, just wash it like that, and um, literally their, their thumbs, thumbs are sticking are out like that. So there's still definite handprints here. It's clear that water alone doesn't do much. What about number three, then? Number three, let's have a take a look. Squeaky clean. Well, almost. It's just a few sporadic colonies. It just goes to show that using soap when you wash your hands is so much better. There are bacteria on your skin that are actually doing you good. So there's no need to keep your hands squeaky clean all the time. But washing your hands with soap and water, especially before you eat, is a great way of protecting you from getting sick. And remember, when you wash your hands, do it thoroughly. A good 20 seconds of washing with soap and warm water will keep your mitts clean. And don't forget your thumbs. Two words. There's nothing like quality family time. You're being a doctor doing surgery. Chris and I love hanging out with our dad. You've hurt yourself playing games, having a laugh, enjoying each other's company. Surgery yell. It's Operation Ouch! You two are terrible at charades. I'm going to go and get some strawberry milk. Mmm, I'm so looking forward to this. What has happened to my strawberry milk? One of you two has drunk my strawberry milk. Well, it definitely wasn't me. It was me. I never liked the stuff. Must be him. Looks like this is a case for an investigation. Ouch. If I'm not mistaken, there should still be some saliva around the rim of this bottle, and saliva contains DNA, the special genetic code 
that's unique to absolutely everybody. So all we need to do is compare the DNA in the saliva here with each of us to find out who stole the milk. Step one in solving the mystery of my strawberry milk is to collect a sample of saliva from Dad, Chris and me. Now, with this and the strawberry milk bottle, I've got everything I need to solve this mystery once and for all. Your body is made of billions of cells, each with a different job to do. But how do they know what their job is? Well, that's where DNA comes in. You, eye colour. You, gender. You, hair colour. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a molecule which contains the instructions for all living things, including everything from whether you're a male or a female to the colour of your skin. This is a DNA testing lab, the perfect place for me to get our DNA tested. And this is Emma. She's a DNA specialist. This is the DNA of a strawberry. Well, wow, so that's real visible DNA. It is, yes. That's incredible. So how similar is that to my DNA? It's very similar. All living things share some of the same functionalities. Even with something like a banana, we share about 50% of our DNA with a banana. Hmm. Dr Chris is probably more like 60%. Oi! Emma is collecting the DNA from saliva on the strawberry milk bottle. She'll now analyse it along with our saliva and get the results. I'm going to catch Chris or Dad, then they're going to be sorry. The DNA data on the top is from the bottle and is that of our thief. The DNA data on the bottom is from our samples. Whoever matches exactly is the culprit. First suspect in the dock is Dad. He's got something in common with the crime scene, but it's not a direct match. So, Dad's off the hook. Now for suspect number two, Dr Chris. So, here we can see that every region we're looking at is a direct match. Chris's DNA and the thief's DNA are exactly the same. I knew it. He's going down for this. I'm going to go and get him right now. Dr Sand? Gonna... What? There's something you probably want to see here. Which is? Um, this is your profile. And it's also a direct match for the crime scene. What? Oh, dear. How's that possible? It definitely wasn't me. Yourself and Dr Chris are identical twins. We've got the same DNA. That's right. Because identical twins have exactly the same DNA, the test can't tell the difference between innocent me and that criminal Chris. I still don't have the evidence I need to put Dr Chris behind bars. I'm going back to the scene of the crime to reinvestigate. Bad news, everybody. I'm afraid the lab results only rule out Dad. Chris, it's either you or me, but because we have the same DNA, we can't be sure which. I guess it's just one of those things that we'll never, ever, ever know. Ever. Sand, I think you're forgetting one thing. Fridge cam. Ooh, fridge cam! Yeah, and fridge cam has the answer to the mystery. Go on, then. Is that me? Well, this proves nothing. This doesn't look good. Well, case closed, I think, Zand. Rods, anyone? Ouch. This is Anywheresville, UK, and two ordinary workmen are going about their business fixing the pavement. Today, we're testing the theory that people will do pretty much anything that someone in authority tells them to do. And it works even better if you're wearing a uniform, which is why we're dressed like this. We've got a fake building site and loads of hidden cameras. I've got a hidden camera in my glasses. I've got a hidden camera in my clip. And that lady over there has got a hidden camera in that black bag. Right, Son, let's get back to work. Will people really do as they're told, no matter how silly? If you guys are going to come through, can you turn sideways? Yeah, like this. And then when you walk through, just go like that. Just like that, OK? Just walk sideways like I am. Just like that. Just sideways like that, just because of the wet cement. Just go sideways. Thank you very much. Stay looking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Just go sideways like that. Thank you. That's perfect. Once you're through, that's great. Walk sideways and look at the concrete. 
You are doing such a good job. Great, and now walk backwards. That's ideal. Sir, if you're going to come through here, can you just go sideways? Just go sideways like that. Thanks very much. That you're good now. So what reason did people have for doing exactly what we told them? They looked like they were builders, so we trusted them and did what they said. If someone was dressed normally, I wouldn't have listened to them, but if you're dressed like in a state of authority, yeah, I would listen. I walked sideways like they asked, and I thought, oh, I look a bit silly doing that. Yeah, I just don't know, just be nice, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. We obviously thought, because he was a, a man in uniform, we thought we was obliged to follow his orders. I just thought it was a bit weird, but I did it anyway. <laughs> yeah. When people are asked to do something by a stranger, even if it's something they don't want to do, they'll often do it anyway, either out of fear of getting into trouble or because they want to please the stranger. Right, Chris, should we get packed up and go? Yeah, of course, let's go. Oh, hold on, son. As you go past the concrete, I want you to turn backwards and then hop on one leg. If you say so. Ouch. Your body is amazing, but sometimes it needs fixing. All over the UK, there are special teams of professionals trained to tackle medical mysteries. The heart is the most important muscle in the body. Between beats, it relaxes and fills with blood, like I filled this tennis ball with water. And then when it contracts, it squeezes the blood out of it, forcing blood around your body. Now, just like squeezing the tennis ball, your heart pumping is hard work. And so to do exercise without getting out of breath, your heart has to be really strong. But not everyone has a tip-top heart. Every year, around 4,600 babies are born with a heart defect. This is 14-year-old Luke. He's one of those who's had heart problems since birth. So, Luke, tell me about the issues you've had with your heart. Well, Chris, I had four things wrong with my heart, and one of those was a hole in my heart. When your heart is working normally, it's incredibly powerful. Blood flows through its four chambers and is then pumped to every part of your body. But when you have a hole in the heart, there's a little opening between two of the chambers. This means blood doesn't flow as well as it should, and so less oxygen gets pumped around the body. What was the effect it had on your life? I was lacking in energy. Whilst I grew up, my friends got faster and stronger. I was staying the same, possibly getting weaker. Two years ago, Luke had major heart surgery, which allowed him to do more exercise. Oh made me fitter and stronger, so I've been able to get out there, do more things, and just enjoy myself. And now Luke is helping others by participating in research into how much exercise is safe for children with heart conditions. Dr Guido Pieles is running the research at Bristol University. Today, Luke is going to do some exercise under the close supervision of Dr Guido and his colleague Craig. This is the first time children's hearts have been monitored like this while they're exercising. Here we're looking right into Luke's heart, and then we see Luke's heart muscle, because after all, the heart is a muscle. Okay. And we can see this muscle contracting, relaxing, at around 80 beats per minute. Luke also wears a mask, so Dr Guido and his team can measure the amount of oxygen he uses. Feeling comfortable? Yep. Good. OK, so we've got a heart scanner, so we can take pictures of the heart. We've got the electrical trace of the heart, so we can look at the rhythm. And then we've got the oxygen mask on, so we can see how fit Luke is. Are you sweating yet? A little bit. Mm -hmm. faint, faint drops of sweat. So your heart rate's now up at 115, so it's gone up quite a bit. Monitoring Luke's heart allows Dr Guido to see how well it's coping whilst exercising. There we've got Luke's heart again, and we can see that Luke's heart is contracting faster. Working much harder, but it's working well. As you can see, the ultrasound image on the left shows Luke's heart beating faster when he's exercising compared to the one on the right when he wasn't. And would you say he's safe to continue doing the kind of exercise he loves to do? Yes, because after all, exercise is good for our heart. It keeps us healthy and makes us live longer. If you have a heart condition, always check with your doctor before exercising. Although Dr Guido's research is only in its early stages, he's hoping to come up with some recommendations which will allow children with heart conditions to exercise safely like Luke. Ouch. I'm wearing a special suit, but can you guess what it's used for? Oh, I know! You're going into space! Uh, nope, try again, Zand. OK, I've got it. You're about to drive a Formula One car. Uh, no, Zand, wrong again. 
How's he doing that with the music? Anyway, Zond is wrong. This is PPE, or personal protective equipment. It's used so that doctors and nurses can treat patients with serious infections without getting ill themselves. Um, I knew that, really. Now, you might have seen suits like this on the news because of the recent outbreak of a very serious virus called Ebola in West Africa. Now, these things make the news because they're rare, but they're also very serious. So, what can we do to stop them in their tracks? Well, it's something I'm closely involved in. So this is the lab that I work in when I'm not on Operation Ouch. Ooh, I've always wanted to see Chris's lab. This is my boss, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi, Chris. Who's that? That is Operation Ouch. Hi, Operation Ouch. Oh, hi, Greg. Come on, Chris, you've got work to do. Now, I study a virus called HIV, but scientists like me study all viruses using really similar techniques to work out how to treat and prevent diseases. And I'm about to show you how we do it. An infectious disease like a virus is similar to a burglar who's found exactly the right spanner to break into your cell's security system and infect them. Scientists like me... Oi! want to find out which part of the virus spanner unlocks the cell. Then we can stop the spanner working and create medicine to make people better. To show you how we do it, I've created my own infectious disease demonstration. I'm going to start with a real virus, but there's something else. Now, to understand how viruses work, we need to make mutants. To make a mutant, I take my original virus and change one thing about it by changing the shape of the spanner. Today, I'm making two different mutants, Mutant 1 and Mutant 2. They're both the same as the original virus. Except I've made a different change in each one in their spanner to see if that change stops that spanner working. I then add each of these samples to healthy human cells to see which one is able to infect them. OK, so now the moment of truth. First, I'm going to show you what uninfected cells look like. So these are healthy cells with no virus on them. They're nice and stuck down to the plate, and there are lots and lots of them. Now cells that have been infected with the original virus. And can you see, all the cells are clumped up and they're floating around, there are a few of them. Then I turn on a special light and the cells glow green, which tells me they've been infected by the virus. So we know this virus is working really well. It has exactly the right spanner to get inside these cells and infect them and make them sick. Time to see what's happened with Mutant 1. Can you see that? The cells are floating around and, just like the original virus, they're all green. So this mutant, the first mutant, still has a working spanner. It can get inside those cells and infect them and make them sick. Now let's check Mutant 2. They look really healthy and there are lots and lots of them. And when we put on the special light, none of these cells are green. So the spanner of Mutant number 2 virus is no longer working. It's not able to get inside the cells, infect them, turn them green and make them go sick. So that's great. We've now discovered which bit of the spanner is the important bit for getting inside cells. Curing a disease doesn't just happen in a day. I've given you a demonstration of how we go about it, but sometimes it takes a long time to find the right mutation. And there are lots of diseases that we still don't understand how they infect human cells. We don't understand how their spanners work, if you like. But research like this has led to some major breakthroughs that saved a lot of lives.